commentator Bud Collins nicknamed him the Brash Basher of Belleville. And through a mammoth 24-year career, Jimmy Connors certainly lived up to that moniker. When he emerged in the early 1970s, Connors transformed, for better or worse, the image of a previously staid sport. He would argue with umpires, wind up opponents and whip up crowds, even, or perhaps especially, when they were against him. He also attempted to sue the ATP and its president Arthur Ashe in a dispute over his world team tennis commitments and managed to get himself booed by the reserved patrons of Wimbledon after skipping a parade of former champions for the tournament centenary in 1977. But Connors was also one of the most naturally gifted and successful players the game has ever seen. He won 109 singles titles and 1,274 matches, both records for a male player in the Open era, and his career span is extraordinary. On tour, he faced both Ken Rosewall, a Grand Slam winner as far back as 1953, and Fabrice Santoro, an Aussie Open quarter finalist as recently as 2006. Connors won eight Grand Slams, five of those coming at home in the US Open, a tournament he played in over four different decades. He first entered qualifying back in 1969, went on to win it three times in the 1970s, twice more in the 1980s, and even made the semis again aged 39 in 1991. That he performed at the top for so long and enjoyed an Indian summer to his career should not come as a surprise given his fierce competitive nature. Connors himself said, there's always somebody out there who's willing to push it that extra inch or mile, and that was me. I didn't care if it took me 30 minutes or five hours. If you beat me, you had to be the best, or the best you had that day. And as sports writer Frank Defford wrote back in 1978, on the eve of that year's US Open, which Connors went on to win, there was more to his victories than just sheer willpower. Connors did not merely win, Defford said in his Sports Illustrated article. He assaulted the opposition, laid waste to it, often mocked it as well, simply by the force of his presence. The other players feared to go against him, because the most awesome legend that can surround any athlete sprang up about Connors. The better any mortal played against him, the better Connors became. He became invincible upon the court, because no man could beat him, and he was inviolate off the court, because his mother had told him so. Connor's mother, Gloria, had coached her son in his formative years, and their bond was instrumental throughout his career. My mother rolled balls to me, and I swung at them, Connors later recalled. I held the racket with both hands because that was the only way I could lift it. Gloria taught him to hit the ball on the rise, something he went on to utilise brilliantly on the courts in New York. An aggressive baseliner, with one of the best service returns ever seen, his style was a counterpoint to the serve and volley norms of the late 70s. One stat sums up the effectiveness of Connor's game. He is the only player to win the US Open on its three different surfaces. He won in 1974 on grass, thrashing Ken Rosewall for the loss of just two games. He won in 1976 on clay, outlasting Bjorn Borg in four sets. And in 1978, he defeat Borg again, this time in straight sets on hard court. He also reached the semi-finals of the Open every year between 1974 and 1985, an unmatched record in the men's singles. His run to the semis again in 1991 was remarkable and earned him a new generation of fans. A wrist injury had limited him to only three matches the previous year, and he'd lost all of them. He had plummeted down the rankings from 14th to 936th, by the time of the 1991 US Open, he had climbed back up to number 174, but needed a wild card to take part. The first round draw threw up a flashback, Connors versus McEnroe, although his opponent was actually John's younger brother Patrick. The fairy tale looked unlikely when Connors lost the first two sets and trailed three love in the third. But as if feeding off the memories of his previous glories, the veteran hauled himself back into the match and at 1.35 a.m. local time, walked off the court a winner in five. His fourth round match took place on his 39th birthday, and he pulled off another minor miracle, recovering from 5-2 down in the fifth set against Aaron Crickstein, 
to force a tiebreak, which he went on to win. Connors also came from behind to beat Paul Harheis in the quarters. The crowd was a heady mix of those old enough to remember his emergence on the scene 20 years earlier and the new 1990s generation, who were more used to cheering on the likes of Andre Agassi. Jim Courier stopped Connors in his tracks in the semi-finals, but it wasn't to be the Brash Basher's last appearance at Flushing Meadows. In July 2006, after a lengthy period out of the limelight, Connors was announced as the new coach to Andy Roddick. Together, they masterminded Roddick's run to the final that year, where he was beaten by Roger Federer. Jimmy Connors' approach to tennis was to take everything – his opponent, the umpire, the crowds, his shots – head on. His attitude at times split opinion, but he also wowed with his daring shot-making, remarkable resilience and phenomenal success. Hated and adored, but never ignored. A phrase made for James Scott Connors, tennis's ultimate maverick.